Welcome to this virtual roundtable discussion on weather data in building performance modelling. I'm Dave Cocking and I'm genuinely thrilled to be joined by a panel of leading experts in our industry today with well over 100 years of experience working with and processing weather data between them. In our expert panel, we've got Drew Crawley, a director at Bentley Systems, an ASHRAE director at large, and the current president of IBITSA World. Also, I hope will be joining us is uh, Joe Huang, the president, founder, and co-owner of White Box Technologies. And last, but certainly not least, Andy Tyndale, the chair and co-founder of Design Builder Software. We'll start the discussion with a 10 minute presentation from each of our panelists on just some of their areas of primary interest. After that, I'll ask our experts questions on a range of topics, such as the evolution of weather data, future climate, data quality issues, and matching the type of data to the application. And then I'll throw it open to your questions at the end. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first presenter, Drew Crawley. Drew is a Director of Building Performance Research at Bentley Systems, an ASHRAE Director at Large and the current IBIPSA World President. Drew led the development, implementation and management of the US Department of Energy's Commercial Buildings Initiative. Zero Energy Commercial Buildings, which is now called Better Buildings. Furthermore, Drew has played a pivotal role in managing the research and development of DOE's building energy software, including Energy Plus, Open Studio, Energy 10, and Do2. Most pertinent to this discussion is Drew's work alongside Linda Laurie in developing and curating the widely used library of hourly weather files available at climate.onebuilding.org. So over to you, Drew. Thank you, David. I appreciate being invited to present on, on climate weather data. It's one of my favorite topics. <clears throat> So I first want to start off by talking about uh, weather versus climate, because I think they're used interchangeably and they're not quite the same. Weather is what's happening now, what you see on your phone, what you see on the Internet, uh, what the weather forecasters are talking about. It's what's happening instantaneously. <clears throat> uh, climate, on the other hand, is a composite. That's a longer term. It may be five years, 10, up to 30 years or looking or even you know, looking at future climate as well. Uh, so it's important to understand the long-term view versus what's happening. So if we're talking climate is changing, then we're looking at what's happened in the past versus what's happening now. On the other hand, uh, weather is quite variable. This is a chart of uh, about 12 hours uh, taken at a research lab in Colorado and what they're recording is one minute intervals of temperature, humidity, solar radiation, cloud cover, et cetera. Uh, they're a solar lab. <clears throat> and you see the vertical bars are the hours and the uh, other, uh, the lines uh, are showing quite a bit of variation in between hours. And if we are just taking hourly data, which most of our simulation data is, it's quite variable. That becomes important if you're doing some types of simulation, such as illumination. The other thing to understand is that uh, climate is not static. It's uh, uh, it, it does change year to year. These are uh, isotherm maps uh, based on uh, ASHRAE standard 169, but there's data for power, which I'll talk about later, uh, showing how it does change year to year. And uh, we are seeing it. We are seeing that change. So like you would expect, this year would be different from next year, et cetera. That does happen in, in climate. Not everything's identical. <clears throat> One of the other things you uh, need to know about in, in looking at climate data is which weather data elements are readily available versus which you may need to calculate or there have been calculations made. 
So dry bulb temperature, humidity, um, cloud cover, wind, velocity, direction, and atmospheric pressure are pretty much commonly uh, commonly observed. But others such as solar irradiance, solar illuminance are not. And wind is uh, one of those things that's kind of problematic because it's very specific to terrain. So you need to understand how that data has been uh, accumulated. And weather data is, uh, and particularly climatic data has become uh, more and more available over time. When I started my career, there were very few files. We'll talk about more of that in a bit. But <clears throat> at that point, it was only available from ground observing station. And those are primarily for aviation. So temperature, humidity, wind speed, direction are kind of their key pieces, atmospheric pressure as well. But you know, wind recorded at a at an airport is going to be very different from uh, from a lo a different locality that may have terrain or building to deal with. Uh, so solar data is one of those things that's just not very available, and you need to understand how that data has been accumulated or or estimated in many cases. Um, one of the good things that's happened over the last few years is that we have now uh, satellite data, particularly for uh, solar radiation. And coupled with reanalysis data sets, uh, this has become a very powerful tool for uh, having data where there's no ground stations. And that, that's one of the really cool things. It, it is uh, does approach the quality of the of the ground stations, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it doesn't require ground stations. Uh, there are master data sets uh, supported by the World Meteorological Society, uh, more, excuse me, World Meteorological Organization, uh, particularly uh, US NOAA's uh, National Centers for Environmental Information does do it a, a uh, uh, gathering of all that data and have been putting that together for many years. The good thing about it, that data is pretty up to date. Normally by the morning, you'll have the previous day's data. So it's a, it's a very useful resource if you're trying to look at recent data. But most of the data we use in simulation, whether it's design conditions or uh, typical meteorological years, need some work to get there. Not, that's not just raw data, and the raw data by itself needs work as well. So the four key sources that we've been working with recently are uh, the Integrated Surface Database. This is that uh, NCEI data set of the location, 25,000 uh, ground-based weather stations globally. About 13, 14,000 are, are reporting data currently, but there has been some history and stations moved, et cetera. The second, the BSRN or uh, Baseline Surface Radiation Network is just 58 stations looking primarily one to three minute data set um, focusing on solar radiation. Uh, they have a lot of meteorological data, but often that's sort of missing. The uh, solar radiation is key. These are then used to be able to calibrate what we're seeing out of the satellites to know and understand what's going on there. So they're very powerful, but they're not that many stations. Uh, NASA has a product called Power, and it uh, takes that solo, so, uh, satellite radiation and uh, combines it with uh, other reanalysis uh, climate data into a single product so that you can take a look at that. It's gridded uh, about a half a degree by five eighths, uh, Launch, uh, latitude, longitude. So it, it's not as uh, <clears throat> refined as you may want, but it is a gridded product. So we have data everywhere. We'll talk a little bit more about some of that uh, later on. Uh, Europe has a, a similar product. Uh, it's the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, or ECMWF. Um, they have a reanalysis product called ERA5. And that Similarly to power, uses multiple satellite reanalysis data sets, but has a, a, a quarter degree by quarter degree grid. The other thing they're doing is uh, refining that to further uh, aspects. 
they have a product called ERA uh, Land, which ignores the oceans and allows them to focus on on uh, coastal locations that may be very influenced by ocean currents. Uh, also, <clears throat> they've got a 30-kilometer uh, grid uh, that's already available. They're working on 9-kilometer. So <clears throat> design conditions, if you've done simulation, you know that we need those to be able to automatically size uh, equipment, um, and they're available. Primarily, we look at things like dry bulb, wet bulb, dew point, wind speed, kind of as the key elements there, but there are many other aspects. Um, <clears throat> the design conditions produced by ASHRAE use percentiles. These just represent the uh, average number of hours in a year that you would expect a temperature would be exceeded. So for 99.6, about 36 hours a year to be colder than that. Uh, for the 1%, about 88 hours a year, uh, it'll be warmer than that. So it's important, important, important to understand how they, they relate and how your variables, uh, uh, which ones are important for your design. The best source is the Ashray Handbook, about 9,200 locations in the most recent version, 2021. <clears throat> but if we're using hourly data, climatic data, um, we need a, a, a single year to run the simulation. We can run subsets, we can run multiple, but most common application is that single year. Uh, TMY, or typical meteorological year, is the most common method. It uses statistics to uh, derive the... Uh, particular months that are most represented out of a period uh, of record for that particular data set. Um, and I won't go into detail about it, but it wind, winds up, uh, you'll hear more from Andy on that. It winds up that you're getting a, uh, a data set that has, uh, may have a January from 2011, a February from 2015, et cetera. And they are uh, all assembled together so that they work well. Uh, the TMY data sets, what they're best for, comparing alternatives during design. They're not intended to be uh, predicting the amount of energy use. They're close, but that's not what they're real use. Uh, you often see them required for use with uh, building standards and codes or green building rating systems. But <clears throat> again, they're not a specific year. Uh, they had no effort in their construction to represent stream conditions or even uh, design conditions. I've seen cases where they were somewhat milder. <clears throat> this is a comparative of uh, uh, for Washington, D.C. that I uh, took a 5,000 square meter office building and simulated it. And for Washington, this particular airport, National Airport, we have data, continuous hourly data from 1937 to present. So I have 85 years of, of simulation here through 2021. And you see it varies quite a bit. It depends on how cold, that's the red and orange, uh, heating and or uh, hot, which is the uh, the cooling. And you see it varies quite a bit. Uh, one example, 2010 there <clears throat> was both a cold winter and a hot summer. So its energy sticks up above many of the others. Now, <clears throat> the last two bars are TMYs. One, which covers this entire period, so 1937 to 21, and the other, which just covers from 2007. You see they vary a little bit. Uh, the most recent one is actually a little lower. And the reason for that is that heating, uh, if you look at that period there, is a bit lower than it had been in previous years. So it's important to capture the most recent data so that you can capture that effect of uh, what's important. So in my career, um, the older typical meteorological data sets, uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of data starting. We were working with mag tapes or punch cards, and you were lucky if you had a single location for uh, of data for that. <clears throat> in the early 80s, we got the TRY, followed very quickly by the TMY. Uh, the TRYs were single year data. The TMYs, again, that approach I talked about, but we still only for the whole U.S. had 234 locations. Newer data came along in uh, TMY2 in the mid-90s, and then TMY3 came along in the late 2000s uh, with 1,000 locations. So pretty good coverage, but still there were large areas out there. 
you see similar sort of progression with IWEC and the IWEC 2. This doesn't mean they're uh, these are the only ones. SIBSI in the UK and many other locations have also had uh, typical meteorological year data sets. Um, actual year, uh, we may need data for a specific year, specific period. If you're trying to look in an existing building and simulate that and calibrate your model to the utility bills, you probably want to work with existing uh, weather data, actual weather data for that period. There are many sources, uh, some of it's near real time. We talked about NCDI, uh, Weather Bank, Weather Source, Weather Underground, all private companies that will uh, uh, provide data for a fee, uh, national meteorological offices as well. <clears throat> also, you can get the data from ERA5 and Power, uh, but they it does have a tendency to be a little different from that. Uh, uh, tends to have kind of shorter diurnal periods. The biggest issue is uh, kind of how complete are they? Does it include what you need? When you get something from one of these private sources or even from NCEI, does it have all the data I need to be able to do that? And generally, yes, for most part, solar radiation is, is has been the issue. <clears throat> Another thing uh, I want to make a point about is that we already seen climate change happening in our design condition. This, this is the 1% cooling design conditions. Uh, with the stack bars for each location is 1997, 2001, et cetera, through uh, 2021. So 24 years of design conditions there. And you see in almost every case, we're seeing a degree, maybe two increase in that 1% uh, cooling design condition in the measured data. I'm not talking about projections or, or future uh, scenarios. So that's important. The one outlier is Winnipeg, which has kind of stayed sort of about the same, maybe dropped a little. Not quite sure why. Um, if we translate that into energy use, what happens? And what you see there for each of those locations are an older uh, TMY set, a intermediate and a recent one trying to show the results. And what you've got is that we're seeing cooling increase almost across the board. Uh, and heating decreasing uh, kind of in the same way. So an interesting uh, change to what we're seeing in that, that swap that kind of reflects what we saw back at National Airport. <clears throat> so climate.one building uh, is uh, a, a new data set. We, we started uh, about six years ago producing data sets. Our most recent TMYX, uh, X to uh, distinguish it from from the TMY three or uh, two, et cetera. Um, but it is a TMY setup. It uses the ISD data uh, from, uh, from NOAA for the meteorological parts, but the solar radiation is from ERA five. So a kind of a marrying of the two. But you see that we have pretty good coverage across the globe with over 13,000 recent ones in 253 countries. Uh, I, I will say that uh, uh, we get about 5,000 downloads of files a day, and we've had over 5 million downloaded in the last 20 months alone. Uh, we're working on a, a, a kind of a minor tweak of the current, the one that goes through 2021. We'll have a few more locations uh, coming online in the next few weeks. Other data sets that we publish, and these are more as a courtesy to, to get them out. Canada has a future climate data set. Uh, seven future references, as well as a TMY. There's CWEC, which has long been the TMY procedure uh, used, and there have been various versions of that over time. Um, interesting climate normals, an hourly climate normal. A normal is something that reflects what the average is uh, over like a 30-year period. That's what the meteorologists often use as 30 years. And this actually has uh, hourly data related to it for, for U.S. locations. Data from Korea, Uruguay, Turkey, Argentina, uh, Japan, uh, older TMI, TMI3A, uh, ISRE, uh, India, Brazil, uh, Iran, Australia, Israel, all, all available up there. Other ones, uh, Germany's BBSR. Uh, New Zealand, Poland, uh, multiple versions of the California Title 24, as well as a China and a Hong Kong data set. So in summary, I want to just say clim climatic data is just critical for what we're 
trying to do uh, in building design, particularly equipment sizing, look at an impact of current and future climates as well. It's really important to be able to have that. So for simulation, we have our typical TMY. We may have actual. Um, in the UK, uh, SIBSI has their design summer year and all the future weather. It can support different ways of looking at buildings. Uh, there is some work going on on what I'll call an X and Y or extreme meteorological year. Remember how the on the national airport there was kind of a range? We want to try to capture some of that and looking at different methods. And we've got a, a research project evaluating several of the methods now. So <coughs> there's a rich resource of data available, both the ground observing station and satellite. And this is just getting better all over time. But be cautious, watch the data, make sure you understand where it came from and how the bits and pieces fit together and what's the quality control. Finally, I just want to show you kind of a map. These are some of the TMYX. Uh, here's North America, Europe, and uh, also uh, Asia there. So with that, I'll uh, we'll do questions separately, but there's my contact information, uh, and I hope uh, this has been useful. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, that was great. Thank you, Drew. Um, I, I actually found it fascinating to see the global perspective on how the heating and cooling design conditions, also the energy consumption, have, uh, have changed between the, the different countries. Okay, so up next with his presentation is Andy Tyndale. Andy is the chair and co-founder of Design Builder with decades of experience in the building energy simulation sector he's amassed a wealth of knowledge through his work in academia design consultancies and r d groups and he is deeply committed to removing unnecessary barriers to the widespread adoption of the latest building simulation technology he has an enduring interest in weather data matching data to the application and developing the Design Builder Climate Analytics Weather Data Service. So, over to you, Andy. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. I'll be giving an overview of the categories of weather data and their application in various types of building energy modeling. I'll explain the basic concepts by referring to a new weather data tool that we at Design Builder have been working on called Climate Analytics. I'll start with an overview of the three broad categories of weather files, which are typical years, design years, and actual years. Each of these is used for different purposes in building energy modeling. Most of you will already be very familiar with typical year weather files that are widely used in building simulation. Typical year files, as mentioned by Drew in his presentation, are representative of long-term weather compiled from 20, 30 or more years of data using one of the TMY, TRY, IWEC, etc. methodologies. They're assembled to match the long-term data from a particular location using a set of statistical measures. And they're used for general purpose energy simulations, compliance and certification analysis. Design years are often based on a specific year of weather data where the year is selected for some extreme characteristic, such as the warmest, coldest, or most humid sequence of days. They're often used for extreme scenario modeling, such as overheating analysis, as well as for heating and cooling system sizing applications. Some modification or morphing may be made to the base data, depending on the requirement. Actual years, contain a specific year of weather data and are often used for post-occupancy measurement and verification studies and uh, model calibration applications where the simulation results are compared to actual utility bills or other measured data. I'm gonna go on to say more about these weather file types and their applications, but first I'd like to show you how they can be accessed in the climate analytics tool that I mentioned earlier.
We've been working with our colleague, Max Ramerson, on a new weather data portal called Climate Analytics, which provides weather data for over 43,000 locations across the globe with a huge database of records going back to 1970. We don't have time today for a full demo, but I'd like to show you a few things to illustrate how the three types of weather data can be accessed and discuss their applications. <clears throat> Firstly, Climate Analytics links to three of the largest typical year weather databases. First, we have the climateonebuilding.org data, developed and curated by Drew and Linda Laurie. This provides free access to a huge range of typical year files. Also, the set of typical year files provided free of charge by Energy Plus and the white box technologies database developed by Joe. This is an extensive database of both typical and actual year files, which are mostly charged for. So I'll select the London Gatwick station to illustrate some of these concepts. As you can see on the external sources tab for this station, a range of data is available from the three databases. You can click on any of these links to access the data. But aside from linking to these actual, these external data sources, the main purpose of climate analytics is to provide access to design and actual year weather files. This data is accessed by clicking on the climate analytics data option. I'm going to choose a new station in Nottingham in the UK to show you this. On the download tab, you can download design year and actual year weather data. For actual year data, you can simply select the year, although there are some more advanced settings. Actual year data is based on hourly values from a dense grid of values from the NASA database. Design year data is based on measured daily min and max temperatures, humidity and wind speed data from stations that is combined with gridded data from the ISD. All solar radiation comes from gridded data built up from a mix of ground station and satellite sources. There are several options to configure the design weather data. I'll show you a few of these. So, for example, when, a simulation, when simulating a NAT vent system, the designer might wish to use a design file with no wind to ensure uh, worst case scenarios are checked. Likewise, when simulations are being used for heating system sizing, we can select an option to generate weather data with no solar radiation to check that the heating design doesn't rely on solar gains. And to check building performance under future climate conditions, you can select from a range of options based on IPCC future climate scenarios. Of course, urban areas can be significantly warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And so climate analytics allows temperature offsets for urban heat islands to be applied to design year files. This morphing can be applied in cases where the weather station is located in a rural area and the project site is in an urban area or vice versa. Here you can see that climate analytics has picked up different day and nighttime temperature offsets for the Nottingham urban area from the NASA UHI database. These offsets can also be inverted for cases where the weather station is in an urban location and the project site is rural. On the analysis tab, there are various tools for analyzing the climate going back to 1970. One useful application of these tools is to help identify design years suitable for the project requirements based on a wide range of criteria. 
For example, the graph currently displayed focuses on extreme hot and cold day sequences. The top and bottom clusters show the average daily maximum and minimum temperatures respectively. Each colored line within these clusters represents a different duration of extreme weather sequence. In this case, you can see that 2022 had the warmest sequence of one, two, three, and four days. And this data can be copied to a spreadsheet for further analysis. This slide shows the same data, but focusing on the four-day sequence of warm days. You can see that in 2022, there was a sequence of four days with an average maximum temperature of around 35 degrees C, the highest in the data set. Uh, so this would be a good design year to select for this location for short sequences of very warm days. This sort of weather data can be especially useful for designing and assessing passively cooled, naturally ventilated buildings for overheating, as well as for wider system sizing applications. Of course, in passive NatVent buildings, heat can accumulate in the building over a period of warm days. So even buildings with high thermal mass may not stay cool after several days of very warm weather. So when assessing a heavyweight building, a design year with a long sequence of hot days, for example, the 20 day criterion, could be used to select an appropriate year. We recommend that in general, buildings whose performance may be sensitive to extreme weather events should be checked with one day, four day, and 20 day design weather years. Moving on to actual years now, as I mentioned earlier, these weather files contain actual data for a specific location and a specific year. They're often used for post-occupancy analysis by developing calibrated models and digital twins, where the simulation results are compared to actual utility bills or other measured data. These models can be used in applications such as measurement and verification studies, um, control optimization, for fault detection and diagnostics, for example, when troubleshooting system controls, retrofits and energy conservation measure savings calculations, such as when using the IPMVP protocol. In climate analytics, a create new location option allows you to generate weather data for a precise site location by triangulating between existing weather stations. The tool allows the base stations to be selected manually to allow you to select weather, data, weather stations with a climate that you may know is representative of the project site. And this will often be more accurate than using an automated gridding approach. So that completes this quick overview of the three types of weather data and their applications. We'll be starting a second round of beta testing on the climate analytics software soon. So if you're interested in being involved, please feel free to sign up for the Design Builder newsletter or follow us on LinkedIn and we'll keep you up to date. We plan to provide more technical details on these tools later in a future webinar. So look out for that through our communication channels shown on the screen. Thanks for listening. Great, okay, thanks Andy. Um, I personally, I think it was a really useful summary of the three different applications for weather data. Um, and I, I suppose also for the audience to get a, a first glimpse at the new climate analytics tool. So as Andy mentioned, we will be, um, we'll be doing a more detailed webinar uh, on that tool in the future. Okay. So um, I'll keep my comments to a minimum and jump straight now into introducing our final presenter in this part of today's session, Joe Huang. So Joe is the president, founder and co-owner of White Box Technologies, which specializes in providing high quality weather data for numerous global locations. Prior to his current role, 
Joe worked at the Lawrence Barclay National Laboratory, where he focused on building energy simulations and building energy policy, particularly in the context of international building energy standards. Joe's passion for providing high quality weather data led to the development of the White Box Technologies Weather Data Service, which has subsequently been instrumental in providing weather data for national data sets. So the floor is all yours, Joe, and we can trans transfer presenters. I'm very happy to participate in this webinar, and uh, I will be talking about the, uh, the latest project that I just finished, and that was on uh, using reanalysis data and then morphing that using climate normals to get uh, weather files for, a lo uh, for locations that don't have any measured data. Uh, so, so this project uh, was. It was just finished in March, uh, in February, and it's for ISHRE, which is the India Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. I have worked with ISHRE for about uh, about eight, ten years, and I helped ISHRE develop uh, a set of uh, sixty some um, typical year files for India. And then about four years ago, uh, ISHRE came. Uh, came back to me and they said they'd like to expand that data set. And um, um, what they wanted was uh, uh, two things. One was to expand the scope to all of South Asia. So now the uh, the new data set, which I've called ISHRAE 3, uh, includes uh, not just India locations, but also locations uh, in neighboring South Asian locations. And the other thing that they uh, ISRE requested was that the data set include 90 smart cities locations in India that are designated by the Indian government for um, uh, future uh, uh, city development. Now, I looked at those, and 60 of those locations, they, uh, since they're new developments, they are small towns, and they don't have any uh, uh, measured weather data. So what I told Ishre was that uh, to create those files, I will use reanalysis data. And then uh, since I've seen from previous experience that the reanalysis data, while it's complete, you, you can have some biases compared to the actual observations of a location. So what I said was I would use reanalysis data and then I would use the technique uh, that's now been called morphing. And that's a technique that I've used on future weather files uh, that I would then take the reanalysis data and then I would morph it by matching the statistics to that from the climate normals. And so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, one last thing about these files is uh, that all the solar data are satellite derived solar data. And uh, that it was also a major improvement over the uh, previous uh, ISRAE 2 weather files. For the ISRAE 2 files, I, um, I did have access to satellite-derived data, but it was uh, too, um, the time period was too short. So what I did was I just used the satellite-derived data to uh, calibrate my uh, model data. But this time, I'm just, there's enough solar data of sufficient length that I, I just uh, used it. Okay, just uh, this is a shot of, uh, I just want to make a shout out to uh, satellite derived solar, which is uh, uh, now very plentiful and also of a long enough time period um, to be used for developing things like typical year weather files and obviously to put into the historical year weather files. And as you see on the coverage here, uh, basically the whole world is now covered uh, except for two two spots that's shaded, and in those, uh, the time period is still too short. Okay, now I'll talk about what's uh, climate reanalysis. I mean, Drew has already uh, mentioned that, um, but I thought I'd um, give a brief uh, explanation of what is climate reanalysis. 
uh, reanalysis is running a, a climate forecast model um, in a sort of a retrospective mode um, that would incorporate the existing uh, available uh, observations from the past and then link that up with uh, the best that um, climate scientists can do to, to model um, the climate. And then the end result is to get a complete map of climate conditions over the entire surface of the planet with no time or space gaps. So, so the data that's coming out from reanalysis is just very clean. It uh, it's, uh, has all the meteorological elements on an hourly basis, and it goes back decades. And um, the grid spacing varies between the different reanalysis platforms, but um, at the courses it's at half a degree, but now they're talking about uh, they've already gone down to 10 kilometers, and they're talking about going even further for special locations. And the well-known reanalysis products, at least the ones that I know of, uh, include Mira 2 and CSFR. Those are United States products. And then uh, ERA5 is a, a European product. Okay, so how do I then re uh, morph this reanalysis data using climate normals? Well, as I mentioned, uh, morphing is actually a technique that I first uh, used uh, to create future year weather files. And what you do is uh, you find the difference in the, uh, uh, let's just take temperature, you take the difference, absolute difference in temperature, and then you take the difference in the um, temperature range and from those differences, you put those um, uh, onto the uh, measured uh, onto the the data, and then you get a, a a slightly modified or substantially modified weather file. So here on top, I show the climate normals for a city in India, Shandigar, and uh, this is taken straight from um, Wikipedia. So it has all these nice colors of the temperature range. Um, what you see is, uh, and this is very standard for uh, weather stations, there's more climate normals than there are uh, synoptic data. Uh, you have the uh, highs and the lows average by month, and then you also have other information uh, like the rainfall, the uh, uh, relative humidity at a one time in, in, the, in the day. And so I take these, and then I also calculate the same statistics from Mira 2, and that's quite easy because the data is very clean. And then I compare the two, and that's what I'm doing on the table at the bottom. Um, so you, you see that on the Mira 2, I have not just the dry bulb, but also the dew point and the relative humidity. And then on the climate normals, which is the uh, three, uh, the four columns in the middle, uh, those are the same numbers as what's on the uh, table above. And then I just compare them and I come out with um, uh, two factors that I've been calling morphing factors. One is the difference in the dry bulb temperature uh, on average. And then the second column on the right is the temperature range. And that I express as a ratio. And lastly, there is the uh, relative humidity difference which is an absolute uh, number. Now, looking at this location, the, um, the correction or the morphing is not very large. I mean, for, for this location, the climate normals match the ones from Mira 2 uh, within, within um, from up to one to two degrees in the temperature, and then uh, within 8% in the temperature range. Uh, however, if you look at the relative humidity, it does show that Mira 2 is uh, uh, producing a relative humidity that's um, from a few percent to um, 11 percent that's higher. So the, the um, morphing, uh, what, what it will do would take the Mira 2 uh, data and it would slightly reduce the temperature, uh, increase the temperature range, and then reduce the uh, relative humidity. Um, of course, when you do this, uh, there's always a question, well, how reliable is this? And you can't tell uh, with that data set 
because there's no uh, observed data to compare to, but you could easily do that for uh, another location. So here I've done it for a near, nearby station uh, that has fairly good um, measure data. And so I did exact same thing to uh, this location and uh, it's called Patna. And uh, on the XY plot on the upper left, you see uh, this is with the original MIRA2 data, you see that uh, there's a noticeable bias on the high end, meaning that the MIRA2 data is uh, up to like four degrees Celsius higher on peak. And then on the right, the XY plot uh, is for the more uh, data, and you see there the uh, um, the bias has gone away, and even the distribution has uh, has gotten tighter. So it looks uh, at this level, it looks uh, um, like the morphing is doing what I intended. Now on the bottom two uh, um, plots, these are the time series, and I always like to look at the time series because uh, you know you, then you can see when this happens. Um, mm -hmm. This is for one year, and uh, so it's kind of hard to see all 8,760 days, uh, uh, 8,760 hours, but uh, you, you should get the general picture. The top is the original data, and the bottom is the morph data. And you see that uh, if you look at the first uh, first half of the year, MIRA2 was over-predicting the, um, the temperatures by about uh, the, um, several degrees up to like four or five degrees. But then when you do the bias adjustment or the morphing, you see that the two are pretty much um, on top of one another, although uh, there, there are still periods where things would differ. Um, so, so that's uh, what I did um, on, on the 60 locations. Uh, I was able to produce, uh, I think like 15, 20 years of data for those. And I morphed all of them. And then from that, at, at that point, then creating the typical year weather files, no different than uh, if you're using actual observations. There was one thing that I found that uh, I thought was interesting is that uh, when you do morphing, it, it's purely statistical. So it's easy for the morphing to produce results that don't make physical sense. And the one that's uh, most often talked about is that morphing can produce dew point that's higher than dry bulb, which obviously can happen. Um, what I've done before was uh, when that happens, uh, I would just set the dew point at the dry bulb. Uh, I wouldn't allow it to go up any higher. However, um, well, that worked in the uh, previous uh, cases where I uh, did future weather files, but that was for locations in California. Uh, where it's um, much drier. And um, there were some cases, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very prevalent. So, so I thought that solved the problem. But here in, uh, uh, this is for India, uh, there are times of the year and locations along the coast where the humidity is very high. And then in those cases, uh, when you do the morphing, it's, um, it produces results where the dew uh, the dew point temperature profile is just doesn't make you, you know doesn't make sense. And so what I show here is for another location that's along the coast, so it tends to get um, humid. Um, on top is the original, and then after I morph it, and the morphing, uh, at least for India, it seems like uh, I, I tend to push down the uh, the temperatures. And so what happened here is that uh, after, after I did the morphing, you'll see a uh, uh, profile. Oh, I should explain what, what these plots are. These are 12 typical days of, for each month. So they're not contiguous, but uh, the, the, you take all, all the days in one month and then you average them. And that's a way for me to look at the data with, uh, and not get overwhelmed by the uh, amount of data. So the top is the, uh, without the morphing, the original, and then the middle one is after it's morphed, and you see in the early parts of the year, the first uh, four or five months, the, uh, the dew point has clearly reached saturation, and I held it there, and then 
as the temperature rises when the sun comes, um, you, you'll follow that for uh, several hours and then it'll drop down again. Uh, that's um, not very realistic. And I thought about this and I said, well, what I should do is, um, you know, looking at the basic physics, that uh, once you've reached saturation, the atmosphere can't hold any more moisture. So um, by that logic, uh, the dew point shouldn't rise. I mean, there isn't enough time for the sun to uh, heat up the ground and then cause uh, evaporation from the, uh, from the soil. So I added another constraint, a simple constraint that if this is what's happening, uh, don't let the dew point go up, but continue it um, uh, at the uh, keep it constant, but do allow it to go down. And the bottom plot is uh, is after I've added this additional constraint, and there you see the uh, hourly profiles seem to look fairly normal. Uh, that's all I have, and um, um, thank you for um, sitting through this presentation. And I believe that uh, we'll all three of us will be available for questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, interesting to hear about the techniques you've uh, been using and the potential for using reanalysis re uh, more widely. So Joe's presentation concludes the individual talks from Drew, Joe, and Andy. Um, thanks to our expert panel for your thought-provoking presentations. There was a very diverse range of content in amongst that lot, which I'm sure our audience found insightful. And before I move on to the next part of today's session, just a quick reminder, remember that you can ask questions in the webinar control panel at any time. If your question is specific to one of our presenters, i.e. it relates to their presentation, please state which presenter your question is for to help us manage the large number of questions um, we receive on top of the ones we already have. So on to the next part of today's discussion, where I'm going to ask a variety of climate and weather related questions to all or some of the panel. And that kind of depends on the, the nature of the question. So, on to my first question then, which I'll ask each of the panel in turn. It's clear from your presentations that we've already got pretty good quality historic, current and future weather data available. So what do you feel are the main issues with the weather data available right now? What do you think are the most likely improvements in the next 10 years. So let's start with you on that one, Drew, if we could. Sure. I think uh, some of the uh, challenges we're seeing is that even though we have pretty good data, uh, we have holes in that. Um, uh, as Joe mentioned, the satellite uh, measured solar radiation helps fill a hole that we've been fighting for many years. Um, but also getting from these pretty coarse grids in some of the reanalysis products, the much finer data is going to help us as well. So I think that's kind of what I hope to see over the next five to 10 years. Okay. Thanks, Drew. Um, so now on to Joe, if you'd like to input on that one. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Drew that um, um, the data, you know, for, um, for like Europe and North America and uh, parts of East Asia is actually pretty uh, comprehensive by now. Um, there are still data gaps uh, in uh, certain parts of the world like Africa and Latin America. And uh, um, that's why the um, newer techniques like using reanalysis, it can kind of help to fill that, uh, fill, fill in those gaps. The other area that I like to see more um, investigation is um, ways to account for microclimate effects. Uh, this is particularly important for uh, for those of us doing building energy simulations because buildings are uh, 
are in uh, urban areas, while the uh, weather data can come from the airport. The, uh, so there's a need to adjust that, and uh, I think there'll be more work on that level. Okay, thanks, Joe. And finally, over to you, Andy. Okay, um, well, uh, Drew and Joe have covered the data quality improvements, but aside from that, um, I'm expecting to see greater integration between weather data sources and simulation tools in future. Uh, for example, we're looking into developing a link between climate analytics and the design builder simulation tools. And the idea is to try to simplify the process of weather data selection and also to make it easier to run parametric simulations where the, where the weather data could be a variable. That should allow us to test the effects of a range of different design weather conditions, uh, also including future climate scenarios. Uh, and that could be possible without actually leaving the energy modeling software if we can make, make these nice links in the future. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, so straight on to my next question, which relates to an emerging uh, area of interest. Andy mentioned end-year design weather years earlier. Stress testing of modeling is a relatively new and interesting approach that seems to be gaining quite a lot of traction. Um, and it seems to be being pushed more now by SIBSI, ASHRAE, and no doubt other industry bodies uh, these days. So could you elaborate on how these tools can be used in practice? Um, given you mentioned this in your presentation, Andy, I'll uh, start with you. Okay, yeah, sure. So as we already heard, <coughs> excuse me, uh, data for extreme weather periods can be especially useful for testing the robustness of system sizing calculations made using the standard sizing methods, such as those required by ASHRAE and SIBSI. In other words, checking for under and oversizing. And one way to do that is to use appropriately selected design weather data in simulations to give an indication of the proportion of the year that design set points would be met during occupied periods. In the UK, um, SIBSI provides summer design years for three different periods of warm weather in their TM49 package, for example. These are similar in concept to the end day approach. Um, that you're asking about and um, they're intended to be used for checking building performance for different types of heat waves including a year with very intense single warm spell and also a year with prolonged period of sustained warmth and um, climate analytics expands on this concept by providing access to weather years for a range of extreme warm period durations and uh, for any location to help check whether a building can cope with various types of hot weather events. It's um, especially useful as a technique when applied to passive and hybrid systems, which really require simulations to check their performance. Systems that have a, the most dynamic interaction with the environment, like uh, free cooling chillers, um, nap vent cooling, and uh, thermal storage systems can benefit the most from this approach. And as I mentioned earlier, it's um, especially important for testing that vent strategies in thermally massive buildings, which can be highly effective in moderating temperatures for short warm weather events, but much less effective for longer heat waves as the building mass heats up. So in this case, the building performance should be checked for a range of warm weather events. Uh, probably worth adding also that, you know, while we've got access to extreme end day historic data, we know that the extremes are going to get worse in future. So we can also apply future climate projections to current extremes to help check designs under various worst case future scenarios. Okay, interesting. Thanks, Andy. Um, have you got anything to add to that, Joe? Uh, no, no, I, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay, no problem. So on to the next question, and it's one that relates to the age-old conundrum of balancing modeling speed, simplicity, and accuracy. So hourly weather files are the norm um, at present, but solar conditions due to intermittent cloud cover, etc., 
can vary a lot in much shorter timescales than an hour. So do you think hourly data is sufficient or do you think there's a need for higher resolution sub-hourly data for some applications? And how do you think higher resolution data might typically affect results? Um, perhaps you could um, start on that one, Drew. Sure. Uh, I've seen several studies that, that looked at the difference of uh, you know higher temporal resolution, um, and it does help some in the uh, if you're doing just regular simulation, particularly if you're looking at uh, HVAC system controls and how that <clears throat> system is responding to, ver to varying inputs. Um, but still, in most of the simulations that I've seen, this, the strongest impact is uh, primarily from the temperature and the solar and the variation there. The, the one exception, though, uh, I've seen is, is illumination. There have been studies shown that if you're doing, trying to do daylighting, that hourly uh, illumination, uh, illuminance data is not sufficient to, to really uh, to get good results because it does vary so much hourly. You know, minute to minute if you're looking at daylighting. Okay, great. Good point, Joe. Thank you. Um, do you have anything uh, to add to that, Joe? Uh, yes, I do. Um, if I could share the screen, I could uh, show um, what, um, uh, an example of uh, going to uh, sub-hourly time steps. Yeah, I think you should be able to see that now on your screen. Yeah, okay. Does this come through? Uh, well, we, we're showing it from this end. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, th um, uh, this is something that uh, I've looked into off and on. And um, the, the only parameter that really changes that much um, within an hour would be the solar. And here, uh, I got some data from uh, a former colleague at LBL uh, where they measured the uh, uh, three locations and um, oh, or four cool roofs and uh, they they did 10 minute data so I, I got um, like six years of 10 minute data and I just looked through one of the files for Miami and I picked the case where uh, you have all this uh, uh, jumping around of the uh, of the uh, solar radiation. So what I show here is what I uh, j just through a brief glance through the data, I picked uh, a case where this effect may be of importance. Uh, you'll see that it's four days in February, and um, uh, the. They're, they're, I'm plotting the solar and the temperature, they're on different scales. Uh, um, temperatures scale is on the left and the solar is on the right. Uh, you see the temperature is pretty contiguous. Um, it doesn't jump around uh, nearly that much. So if you interpolate, um, you're almost bound to get it right. I mean, that's another way to do it is if you have hourly data, you just uh, go to a finer resolution by interpolation. The solar, however, um, on cloudy days, uh, partly cloudy days, you could have these spikes, and that's the thing that's uh, uh, of some concern. And what I did was I showed um, what the 10-minute uh, data is, and then I show what, what it is if you just take the values at the hour time step. Um, and, and then I uh, calculated how big is the difference, and uh, that's what I show in that little table uh, below, I looked at the worst case, which is the first day here, uh, where the solar has jumped around a lot. And then I looked at the whole four day sequence. And then I did the same thing for the entire year. And you see temperature, um, very, very little difference. I mean, it's all within a percent. The solar is, um, on the worst day, it could be as much as 14% difference uh, on this worst day. And then for the whole sequence, it just drops down to 2% because um, if you have a clear day, uh, this effect is uh, not very uh, significant, uh, especially if you interpolate. Um, but and for the entire year, it's also within a percent. So my main uh, observation from this is that 
it may have an effect on uh, particular days where it's uh, the sun is moving uh, or the clouds are moving uh, in front of the sun uh, uh, off and on. But um, for a total annual simulation, I don't think it makes a big effect. That's all I have. Okay, yeah, really good stuff. Thank you, Joe. Um, right, now on to a topic that's become progressively more important to many designers and modelers in our community in recent years. So it's the use of future weather data for checking building performance in climate change scenarios, which is now fairly common in quite a few countries. But for each future year period, there seems to have been a proliferation of scenarios and future periods from a, a whole range of organizations. So how should energy modelers decide which future, future weather data source is the most appropriate for their design and assessment simulations? So perhaps you could kick that one off, Joe? Oh, uh, I'm not really prepared. Um, Oh, what was the question again, please? It's it's well, about the, uh, the the future weather data for checking building performance in climate change scenarios. Um, the, there's been a proliferation of scenarios and future periods yeah. from okay. multiple organisations. So how do you think energy modellers should decide which future weather data source is the most appropriate? for their simulations? Well, um, from, from all the work I've seen, um, you know, there are different scenarios for different uh, uh, responses to climate change. And what I've seen basically is that people would do the, uh, the average uh, or the most likely to occur situation. Um, I mean, you have to be careful when you choose because uh, the, the, the range is, uh, uh, it's fairly large. I mean, the the extreme case where there's no action on climate change, uh, it could be like uh, two or three times what it is for the average case. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of that is depends on the user and also on the client. I mean, I've had a case where a client said they wanted to look at the worst case. Um, uh, so, so it's it's a developing science and. Uh, um, it, it uh, really depends on your uh, your perspective. Yeah, that's all I okay. have. Okay, absolutely. Thanks, Joe. Um, over to you, Andy. Yeah, I can say a few words about that. Um, the first thing I'd say is that it, it's worth mentioning that uh, for some applications, like uh, UK SIBSI overheating calculations, TM59, TM52, for example, the standards actually require modelers to use specific SIBSI future climate DSY uh, design summer weather files so in that case the, there isn't any uncertainty you know what you've got to do but uh, for general purpose simulations without those constraints there are many sources and scenarios of future climate data that you can choose from and, and yes it can be confusing uh, the various IPCC reports over the years have provided different scenarios ranging from the a1, A2, B1, B2 storylines from the third and fourth reports through to the RCP and SSP scenario um, lines provided in the most recent fifth and sixth reports. And these have all got their areas of validity. So depending on the objective of the study, you might select one or more periods. Um, for example, you might select 2050, 2080, uh, et cetera, um, and one or more scenarios as appropriate. Each storyline represents a different type of future climate with unknown probabilities. So you might want to use a representative set of those to get a sense of the range of possible outcomes. And uh, the future periods you select may depend on the expected lifespan of the building and its systems being checked. So you know, if your system is only expected to, to last 50 years, there's not a lot of point in running simulations 200 years in advance. For example, but there are several tools available that can provide future climate data for various future periods using various sets of scenarios, including, as we saw earlier, 
the design builder climate analytics tools. They all work in a similar way, as far as I know, by applying predicted changes for temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind, etc., to the base historic weather data for that location uh, using some sort of morphing technique. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, David, so I, next up is. Uh, if sorry. I could add to that. Yeah, sure. uh, I'm asked similar questions. Yeah, I think there are there is a place for looking at future climate, you know, if it's regulatory uh, requirement uh, or, or other. But for most applications, the building systems, whether it's a you know um, HVAC system or even a building envelope, is likely to be changed over its lifetime or improved or you know retrofitted. And so we need to be careful in trying to uh, not make um, judgments about current systems based on future, because our buildings will change. You know, as I showed, the design conditions are already changing, so it will change over the life of the equipment, and and a lot of that will be built into that for the future. Yeah, that's a good point, Drew. Thank you for inputting on that. Okay, so. Next up is a question that I'm sure many of our audience have, uh, have asked themselves uh, before now. So how close to the project site does the weather station need to be? And perhaps you could answer that one, Andy. Yeah, we, we get this on our support desk uh, fairly frequently. Um, unfortunately, there's no simple answer to it. It really depends on the site and the weather data location. Uh, of course, altitude and proximity to large bodies of water can have a big impact. Um, for example, a coastal location can have quite a different weather data or a different weather rather from a site a little further inland. Uh, an example we often hear is um, uh, for the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the climate of San Francisco, which is surrounded by water, is very different from that of San Jose, which is only 50 miles away separated from water by mountains and so it's much warmer. In this case clearly having data for the right location would be really important. If there is data for a nearby location of a, of a known similar climate then you can use that. Um, in general I think it's fair to say that it's best to prioritize climatic similarity over physical proximity. But otherwise, if there's no suitable nearby station, triangulation can be used to interpolate data between the nearest sites. When interpolating, it's best to choose base sites with a climate similar to the project site. And um, as I showed in my presentation, we've provided a simple manual interpolation tool in climate analytics to help users apply their knowledge of the nearby location's climate and avoid errors that you might that might otherwise occur if you are using an, auto, an automated gridding approach. Okay, thanks, Andy. I, th I think um, we'll drill a little bit deeper now into that question, uh, and particularly for those of you modeling buildings near the coast. So for coastal locations, how accurate is gridded data likely to be? And could data be picked from the sea location or land? Um, does it even matter? Uh, perhaps you could start on that one, Joe. Uh, yes. Um, gridded data, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it takes the uh, conditions of a grid cell, and then uh, uh, that's used to uh, calculate the, uh, uh, the resultant climate conditions. And the main problem with coastal locations is that uh, uh, if the uh, midpoint of the of the grid cell is uh, actually in the waters, then you, you'll get one number, and if it's on land, you'll get a very different number. So I've seen cases, like I think, I looked at gridded data for Vancouver, uh, not Vancouver, Victoria Harbor in Canada, and uh, it's in a very uh, complex uh, geography there, and the results on the gridded data was, uh, or um, when I say gridded data, I mean the reanalysis data was just way off compared to the actual uh, measured data. Uh, so um, 
it, you know, the maritime effect on uh, coastal areas, you know, just extends in uh, a few kilometers. Um, so um, that's why they have problems. And I know like uh, some of the reanalysis tools are looking at uh, going to find a re resolution right on the coast. Um, but it is a, a, a known problem. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, do, do you have anything to add to that, Drew? Yeah, I, I think it is interesting to, to see the coastal um, here in Washington, D.C. In, if I look at the power with a half a degree grid, uh, there are actually three weather stations within that. Uh, two of them are on uh, tidal uh, bay uh, parts, and then one is inland far enough. And the grid it actually matches the inland. If you compare the diurnal curves of a single day, you'll see that the uh, uh, the inland station matches that quite well, but the land doesn't. Uh, I have some hope from uh, some of the reanalysis work, uh, particularly uh, the ERA, uh, because they have a new product called ERA5 land. Um, I'm taking a look at that and comparing it to the, just the regular gridded data to, to see what happens, and also contrasting it with uh, about uh, a dozen or so coastal locations and their, their station data. So it'll be interesting to see. Okay, thanks, Drew. So, our final question, uh, which is a, a pretty open one that I hope will be helpful to many of our audience, um, certainly those at the more detailed end of the uh, modeling and weather spectrum. Uh, are there any common things you think modelers should look out for when checking weather data? I'll start uh, with you on that one, if I may, Andy. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've checked quite a few weather files over the years, as you might imagine. Uh, I usually start with the solar data, as that tends to be the most difficult to get right. Um, so I've just got a list of, of um, thoughts here. Um, uh, in most locations, you would expect um, the direct normal solar to peak between 800 and 1,000 watts per square meter on sunny days. Um, so look out for that. In uh, some weather data, I've seen um, large spikes of direct normal solar at the beginning and the end of the day when the sun is low in the sky. Um, and that could be caused by data processing that involves dividing by the sign of the solar altitude, um, which will be a very small value at low sun angles, for example. And that sort of error can, can magnify um, any other small errors in the data. Another thing that uh, can go wrong um, and would be worth checking for is that the daily solar profiles peak at the expected time uh, for a, a sunny day, for example. That, that should be around solar midday. Uh, for some locations, that may be very different from midday local time. Uh, uh, an extreme example of that is in West China, where you would expect to see the solar to peak in the late afternoon. So um, that's always worth looking out for. Some locations, like in the UK, have many days with no sunshine. So uh, make sure that the direct normal solar radiation um, matches that your, your expectations. In general, just make some common sense checks, you know, that sort of thing. And also, does the wind speed and direction vary by hour? If not, the weather data is not going to be much use for natural ventilation studies, for example. And uh, Joe gave a, um, a really good example earlier about dew point temperature, that that should never be any higher than dry bulb temperature. You can look out for that sort of thing. And, um, well, I mean, th th there are various ways to quickly check hourly weather data. Um, I've tried various techniques over the years. EPW files can be loaded into um, various free tools, such as the Design Builder Results Viewer. Um, there's, there are other tools, DView, you, you, some of you may have used that. CBE Clima um, allows um, EPW's files to be uploaded. Or simplest of all, just load them into Excel and treat them like CSV files. These are all sensible ways to to check your data. Okay, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Okay, uh, yeah, fire away, Joe. Yes, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, the, uh, there's a, 
Uh, I've seen also the problems that uh, Andy had mentioned about the solar radiation. And uh, my experience is also that the solar radiation is um, the most tricky part of, uh, uh, of the data. And the problem is not the solar radiation, but it's with the time synchronization. And the thing that I noticed is that uh, North America actually uses a different convention for the solar radiation that's on a weather file than uh, uh, I think the other countries of the world where um, Energy Plus being a, a US uh, developed program, it uses, it follows the North American convention. In the North American convention, the, uh, the solar at that time step is the solar for the previous, uh, over the previous time step. Um, whereas in, um, in other countries uh, on the weather file, the solar radiation is the uh, instantaneous amount at that hour. And, uh, you know, like in Australia, they actually produce uh, two sets of weather files. Um, and the solar on one is 30 minutes um, uh, uh, behind the other one. And I first noticed that uh, on an IEA project where I was exchanging weather files with uh, somebody in uh, Scotland at uh, uh, Strathclyde. I think they were running uh, uh, ESPR. And when I looked at his weather data, I, I saw these big spikes in the morning and in the evening. And that's because the, uh, the weather, uh, the solar on there is different than what I've been expecting. So uh, that, that's a warning to everybody that if you get a weather file that's created in the wrong convention, you have to uh, adjust the solar to make it work in Energy Plus or DO2 or any uh, North American derived program. And there are several ways to check if the solar is um, correct or uh, it, it's uh, synchronized properly with the weather file. And one way is to look at the ratio of uh, the direct, uh, the diffuse to the toto, and then compare that to the, uh, between the toto and the extraterrestrial. And it should follow this um, equation, this herbs equation, and if it doesn't, uh, the solar data will uh, uh, will splay. Uh, the the plot will be really splayed out, and it's very easy to uh, detect that um, discrepancy. So that's been my experience. That when I import solar data into my uh, my weather files, uh, the, um, it, it's very uh, it's very tricky because um, you know same thing with the. Uh, solar data that's provided by the satellite solar uh, um, uh, websites. Um, the, U, uh, the NREL on the National Solar Radiation Database actually gives you the instantaneous value at, at that time step. Whereas uh, CAMS in Europe, they, get, they actually give you the aggregate uh, over the, uh, uh, up to that time, uh, that time stamp. And so with the NREL data, when I import it, I have to um, adjust it. I have to take a half hour of the previous time step uh, or a quarter of the data from the previous time step, and then half of the data from the current time step, and then a quarter of the data from the, uh, uh, the next time step. So um, that's just a warning that if you're trying to work with uh, solar data from different sources, um, you have to be very careful on the time synchronization. Okay, some really useful um, little snippets of information in there, Joe. Actually, some of them not so little, I think. Uh, no doubt the cogs are wearing for a lot of our audience uh, with that. Um, and so to round off this part of the session, um, I just wondered whether you have anything to uh, to say on this, this question, Drew? Yeah, I, I pretty much echo what Andy and Joe were saying. Um, I, I like to use a, a free tool which works very much like uh, design builders tools uh, called DView, because I can look at aggregates of single months and compare data from different files. Um, it, it gives me a, a chance to look at it, but one of the things uh, always to look at is uh, how well the, the data are documented, what are the source, what has been done to keep to clean it, to uh, massage it before it gets up there, because no data source is, is really 
uh, completely clean. So that that's an important thing is to know your uh, know the source data uh, well enough to to be able to make a judgment about it. But nothing beats just looking at the raw data. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Drew. Um, Okay, so thank you, uh, Joe, Drew, and Andy for giving us the uh, benefit of your vast experience. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody listening has gained some important and useful knowledge um, from your various answers. 